It was a rainy night when I hailed the taxi, the kind of night where shadows cling to the edges of every corner and the world seems shrouded in an eerie haze. I had just finished a late shift at the hospital, my body aching for rest. The cab pulled up, its tires splashing through puddles, and I slipped inside eager to be home. The driver, a gaunt man with hollow eyes, offered a nod as I settled into the back seat. The interior smelled faintly of damp earth, and I shivered, attributing it to the relentless downpour outside. As we pulled away, the city lights blurred into streaks, creating a surreal canvas against the window. Where to? he asked in a voice that seemed to echo within the confines of the cab. Maple Street, please, I replied, stifling a yawn. The driver nodded again, and we lapsed into silence. I reached for my phone to check messages, but it slipped from my hand and fell to the floor. As I bent to retrieve it, my fingers brushed against something metallic. I glanced down and my heart skipped a beat. There were no door handles. Excuse me, I called out, trying to keep my voice steady. There are no handles back here. The driver's eyes met mine in the rearview mirror, and a slow, unsettling smile spread across his face. I know. Panic began to rise in my chest. Why are there no handles? I demanded, trying to sound authoritative despite the growing fear. You see, he began, his tone conversational. This isn't an ordinary taxi. I've been cursed. Cursed? I echoed, the word feeling foreign and absurd. What do you mean? Many years ago, he continued, his eyes now fixed on the road ahead. I made a grave mistake. I angered a powerful spirit. In its wrath, it condemned me to drive this cab for eternity, trapping souls along the way. You're my next passenger. I stared at him, my mind racing to process the information. You're insane, I said, my voice trembling. Let me out of this car. He shook his head slowly. I wish I could, but it's not up to me. The curse has rules, and I must obey. I lunged forward, pounding on the partition that separated us. Let me out, I screamed. But the driver remained unperturbed, his expression almost sorrowful. It's useless, he said. The cab decides when and where it stops. Until then, you're trapped. Desperation clawed at my insides. I pounded on the windows, screamed for help, but the world outside seemed oblivious to my plight. The rain poured down harder, muffling my cries. Time seemed to stretch and warp as the cab sped through the darkened streets. The cityscape began to change, the familiar buildings replaced by unfamiliar, twisted structures. The streetlights flickered and died, plunging us into an otherworldly gloom. Where are you taking me? I whispered, fear choking my voice. To a place where lost souls dwell, he replied. A place between worlds, where the cursed find no rest. I clutched my seat, my knuckles white with terror. The cab's interior felt colder, the air thick with a sinister presence. My thoughts raced. There had to be a way out. I couldn't just accept this fate. In a desperate bid, I searched the cab for anything that could help. My eyes landed on a small, ornate mirror hanging from the rear view. I remembered an old legend my grandmother used to tell me about mirrors being portals to other realms. Gathering my courage, I reached out and grabbed the mirror. The driver's eyes widened in alarm. What are you doing? He shouted, his calm facade cracking. Ignoring him, I focused on the mirror, whispering an incantation my grandmother had taught me long ago. The words felt strange on my tongue, but I could feel a power stirring within them. The mirror began to glow, its surface rippling like water. The driver screamed, a sound of pure anguish, as the cab shuddered violently. I closed my eyes, gripping the mirror tightly, and prayed for deliverance. When I opened my eyes, I was no longer in the cab. I found myself standing on a deserted street, the rain still pouring but the world around me eerily quiet. The cab was gone, along with its cursed driver. I took a deep breath, the cool air filling my lungs. I was free. Shaking, I started to walk, determined to put as much distance between myself and that nightmare as possible. As I made my way home, the events of the night played over in my mind. I knew I had encountered something beyond the realm of ordinary experience, something that defied logic and reason. 
But one thing was certain. I had escaped, and I would never forget the terror of that cab, nor the lesson that sometimes there really is no way out. Or so I thought. Weeks later, as I tried to piece my life back together, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still watching me, lurking in the shadows of my dreams. The cursed cab had vanished, but the driver's warning echoed in my mind. One night, as I lay in bed, I heard a familiar sound, the low rumble of an engine outside my window. I froze, my heart pounding. I peered through the curtains, and there it was, the same taxi, waiting in the darkness. This time, I knew there would be no escape. The curse had found me once more. It was one of those nights when the city felt like it was holding its breath. The streets were quiet, unnaturally so, and the usual hum of life had faded into a stillness that made me uneasy. My taxi glided through the empty avenues, the street lights casting long, flickering shadows on the pavement. I'd been driving for hours, picking up the odd late-night fare, but now it seemed like the city had fallen asleep. I was about to call it a night when I saw him. He appeared out of nowhere, standing on the corner of a dimly lit street, waving frantically. I almost didn't see him, just a flash of movement in the dark. I pulled over, the tires skidding slightly on the slick asphalt. The man yanked the door open and practically threw himself into the back seat. Go, just drive, he gasped, slamming the door behind him. I hesitated for a moment, caught off guard by his desperation. He was disheveled, his clothes rumpled and his face pale, beads of sweat clinging to his forehead despite the cool night air. His eyes were wide, darting nervously around as if he expected someone or something to appear at any moment. Where to? I asked, trying to sound calm, but his panic was infectious. My fingers twitched on the steering wheel. Just go anywhere, no wait. He fumbled in his pocket, pulling out a crumpled piece of paper. His hands shook as he shoved it toward me. This address, please hurry. I glanced at the paper. The address wasn't far, maybe a ten-minute drive, but it was in a part of town I usually avoided at this hour, run down, abandoned in places. A perfect setting for things best left unseen. Still, affair was affair, and the guy clearly needed help. All right, hang tight, I said, pulling back into the street. He slumped in the back seat, his chest heaving as he tried to catch his breath. But even as he settled in, his head kept whipping around, eyes fixed on the rear window. Every few seconds he'd glance back, his fear palpable. I checked the mirrors, scanning the empty road behind us. There was nothing there. No cars, no pedestrians, not even a stray cat. Just the quiet city and the distant hum of neon signs. You okay back there? I asked, trying to make conversation to ease the tension. He didn't answer right away. His gaze remained fixed on the rear window, his hands gripping the edge of the seat so tightly his knuckles were white. They're following me, he whispered, his voice barely audible over the sound of the engine. They've been following me for days. I don't know who they are, but they won't stop. I, I think they want to kill me. A chill crept up my spine. Who's following you? He shook his head, as if trying to clear his thoughts. I don't know. Shadows figures. I see them out of the corner of my eye. But when I turn around, they're gone. But I know they're there. I can feel them. I glanced at him in the rearview mirror. His eyes were wide with terror, darting back and forth as if expecting those shadowy figures to materialize in the cab. Hey man, there's no one behind us, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. It's just us, you're safe here. He didn't respond. Instead, he huddled deeper into his seat, pulling his jacket tighter around him, as if it could shield him from whatever he believed was after him. The rest of the ride was silent, except for his frantic, shallow breathing. I kept my eyes on the road, but every now and then I'd glance at the mirror, half expecting to see something lurking in the darkness behind us. But there was nothing. Just the empty streets and the quiet, oppressive night. We were nearing the address when I noticed something strange. The temperature in the cab had dropped significantly, a sharp, biting cold that seeped into my bones. I fiddled with the heater, but it was already on full blast. The air felt damp, like the inside of a freezer, and I could see my breath misting in front of me. Are you cold back there? I asked. But the moment the words left my mouth, I realized the back seat had fallen silent. 
I glanced in the mirror he was gone. The back seat was empty, the door still shut, the windows closed, but where he had been sitting, there was a dark wet spot on the seat, as if he'd been drenched in icy water. My heart skipped a beat, and I slammed on the brakes, the taxi screeching to a halt in the middle of the street. I whipped around staring at the empty back seat, my mind racing. He couldn't have just vanished. People don't just disappear into thin air. But there was no sign of him, no open door, no sound of footsteps running away, nothing but that cold, damp spot where he'd been sitting. I sat there for a moment, the silence pressing in on me. My mind struggled to make sense of what had just happened. Then, almost mechanically, I turned back to the wheel and checked the address on the crumpled paper. I was only a block away. Maybe someone there would know what had happened to him. The house was old and weathered, its windows dark and lifeless. There were no lights on, no signs of life. The front yard was overgrown, the gate hanging off its hinges. I parked in front, the engine still running, and stared at the house, a sinking feeling growing in the pit of my stomach. This place felt wrong. Like a place where bad things happened. I didn't want to go to the door, didn't want to step out of the safety of the car. But I knew I had to. Maybe, just maybe, someone inside could explain what was going on. Maybe there was a rational explanation for all of this. I killed the engine and stepped out into the cold night air. The wind whipped around me, carrying with it the faint scent of decay. The front porch creaked ominously as I approached, and with every step my dread grew. I knocked on the door, the sound echoing through the empty house. For a long moment, there was nothing just the wind and the distant hum of the city. I knocked again, harder this time. Finally the door creaked open, revealing a woman in her late fifties, her face lined with grief and exhaustion. She looked at me with hollow eyes, eyes that had seen too much. Can I help you? She asked, her voice flat, devoid of emotion. I, I'm a taxi driver, I began, unsure of how to explain what had happened. I picked up a man, he was frantic, said he was being followed. He gave me this address, but he vanished, just disappeared. I don't know what's going on, but I thought maybe you could help. The woman's eyes widened, and she sucked in a sharp breath. She leaned heavily against the doorframe, her hand trembling as she raised it to her mouth. You, you saw him, she whispered. You saw my son. Her words hit me like a punch to the gut. Your son, but he disappeared. He was here, and then he was gone. Tears welled up in her eyes and she shook her head slowly. He's been gone for a year. He was killed, murdered, right here in this house. They never found who did it. But every year, on the anniversary of his death, people say they see him, frantic, scared, trying to get home. But he never makes it. He never makes it home. I stared at her, the pieces slowly falling into place, the frantic man, the fear in his eyes, the way he'd kept looking behind him as if something was after him. He'd been reliving his last moments, trapped in some endless loop of terror, trying to outrun the fate that had already claimed him. I'm sorry, I managed to say, my voice barely a whisper. The woman nodded, tears streaming down her face. So am I, every year I wait for him, but he never comes home. I didn't know what to say, so I just turned and walked back to my car. The cold night air bit at my skin, and the fog had begun to roll in again, thick and suffocating. I climbed into the driver's seat and stared at the crumpled piece of paper still sitting on the dashboard. The address blurred in front of my eyes, and for a moment I thought I saw his reflection in the rearview mirror, just a fleeting glimpse of his pale, terrified face, and then he was gone. I started the car and drove away, the old house disappearing into the fog behind me. But no matter how far I drove, I couldn't shake the feeling that he was still with me that I could still feel the cold, damp spot on the back seat. A reminder of the passenger who would never find his way home. It was a cold, misty night when I received the call. The city streets were shrouded in a thick fog, giving everything an eerie, almost dreamlike quality. My taxi's engine idled softly as I waited at the curb for my next fare. The illuminated sign above flickered casting a pale yellow light that barely penetrated the murk. I glanced at the dashboard clock, 3.17 a.m., the witching hour. I was about to pull away, figuring my potential passenger had decided to walk instead. When I saw him, a man emerged from the fog, 
his figure barely discernible until he was almost at my window. He was tall and thin, his face pale as though he hadn't seen daylight in years. His eyes were deep-set, with dark circles beneath them, and his hands trembled slightly as he opened the door and slid into the back seat. Where to, I asked, trying to sound nonchalant. But something about him put me on edge. He hesitated, then muttered, Just drive, I'll tell you where to go. His voice was raspy, almost a whisper, and it sent a chill down my spine. I forced a smile, adjusted the rearview mirror to keep an eye on him, and pulled away from the curb. The silence in the car was thick, oppressive. The only sound was the soft hum of the tires on the wet pavement. After a few blocks, he finally spoke again. Do you know, there used to be another taxi driver around here. A real sicko. They say he picked up passengers late at night. Just like you're doing now. I felt a knot form in my stomach. Oh, can't say I've heard about that. The man leaned forward slightly, his eyes glinting in the rearview mirror. Yeah, he'd drive them around just like this. But instead of taking them home, he'd take them somewhere else. Somewhere quiet, where no one would hear them scream. I swallowed hard, my hands gripping the steering wheel a little tighter. That sounds like an urban legend, I said, my voice betraying a slight tremor. Maybe, he replied, a faint smile curling his lips, but then again maybe not. I tried to focus on the road, but my mind kept drifting back to his words. The fog outside seemed thicker now, the streetlights dimmer, as if the world itself was closing in around us. I turned onto a side street, hoping he would give me more specific directions. But he remained silent. After a few minutes, he spoke again, his voice softer, more menacing. They say this guy, this driver, he had a way of making his passengers disappear. No one ever found out how. No one ever found the bodies. Just gone. A shiver ran down my spine. I didn't like where this was going. That's pretty creepy, I managed to say. He leaned back in his seat, his eyes never leaving mine in the mirror. Creepy, yeah. But what's really scary is that he was never caught. Some say he's still out there, still driving, still picking up people in the dead of night. People like you. My breath caught in my throat. I forced a laugh, but it came out strained. You've got quite on imagination. He didn't laugh. Instead, he stared at me with those unnerving eyes, his face unreadable. Do I? Or maybe I just know things. Things that you'd rather forget. I tried to shake off the unease focusing on the road ahead, but it was as if the fog had swallowed the city whole. There were no other cars, no pedestrians, no signs of life at all, just the two of us, alone in the mist. Take the next left, he said suddenly. I did as he asked, the street narrowing as we entered a more desolate part of town. The buildings here were old, crumbling, their windows dark and empty. It was a place where the city's forgotten came to rot. As we drove deeper into this forsaken area, he continued his story. He had a favorite spot, you know, a dead-end road just like this one. No one ever went there. Too many bad memories, too much, death. I glanced at him in the mirror, my heart pounding in my chest. How do you know all this? His smile widened, but there was no warmth in it. I've heard things, seen things. You'd be surprised what people confess in the back of a taxi. The road ahead was coming to an end. Just as he said, the buildings thinned out, giving way to overgrown lots and abandoned warehouses. The headlights barely cut through the thickening fog, and I could feel the weight of the darkness pressing in on us. This is the place, he said, his voice barely more than a whisper. Stop here. I brought the car to a halt, the engine ticking softly in the silence. My hands were clammy on the wheel, my breath coming in shallow gasps. I didn't know what to expect but I knew it wasn't going to be good. He leaned forward, his face now inches from mine in the mirror. This is where you buried them, isn't it? He asked, his tone almost playful. My blood ran cold, w what? The bodies, all those people you picked up. You thought you could just bury them and forget about it, didn't you? But they don't forget, and neither do I. I stared at him, my mind racing. This was insane. He couldn't know. He was just trying to scare me. But the way he looked at me, the certainty in his voice. You've got the wrong guy, I stammered. I've never. He cut me off with a sharp laugh, a sound devoid of any humor. Oh, I don't think so. You see, I know all about you. I know what you've done. And now, so do you. Before I could react, he opened the door and stepped out into the fog. I watched in stunned silence as he walked away. 
his figure gradually dissolving into the mist. And then he was gone, leaving me alone in the middle of nowhere, with nothing but my own thoughts and the weight of his words. I sat there for what felt like an eternity, my mind a whirlwind of fear and confusion. Was it possible? Could I have done those things? The memories were hazy, fragmented, but the more I tried to push them away, the clearer they became. Faces, voices, screams, my heart pounded in my chest as I looked around, the desolation of the place overwhelming. This was where it had all happened. This was where I had. No, I couldn't think about it. I had to get out of here. I slammed the car into gear and sped away from the dead-end road, my mind racing as fast as the car, but no matter how far I drove I couldn't escape the truth. The memories flooded back, each one more vivid than the last. The feeling of the shovel in my hands, the cold earth beneath my feet, the stench of decay. I glanced in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see him sitting there, watching me with those knowing eyes. But the back seat was empty. Or was it, in the darkness, I could almost make out the shapes, the faces of those I had tried so hard to forget. The road stretched on endlessly, the fog growing thicker with every mile I couldn't escape it. I couldn't escape them. They were with me now, and they weren't going anywhere. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I pulled over, the car skidding to a stop on the side of the road. My hands were shaking, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I couldn't do this. I couldn't live with this. I had to end it one way or another. But as I reached for the door handle I heard it, a soft, familiar voice, whispering in the back of my mind. This is where you buried them, isn't it? I froze, the terror coursing through me like a living thing. I knew that voice, it was my own, and in that moment I understood. The passenger hadn't been real. He was just a manifestation of my own guilt, my own madness. I had been talking to myself the whole time, unraveling the truth that I had buried deep within my mind, along with the bodies. I looked down at my hands, still shaking, and saw the dirt beneath my nails, the blood that would never wash away. There was no escaping it now. I was trapped in my own nightmare with no way out. The fog pressed in around me, suffocating, relentless. And as I sat there in the darkness, I knew there was only one way to end the torment. I reached for the ignition, my fingers trembling as I turned the key. The engine roared to life, the headlights cutting through the fog like twin beams of judgment. I took a deep breath my decision made. I would return to that dead-end road to the place where it had all begun, and there I would confront the horrors of my own making, once and for all. As the car sped down the desolate road, the fog swallowing me whole, I knew there was no turning back. This was my punishment, my penance, and in the end, there would be no escape. 